Victor, he will start this with the first lecture of his tutorial. Okay, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, usually it's uh, traditional to, to thank the organizers for, uh, uh, for inviting me, but <laughs> being one of the organizers, <laughs> it's, a it's a little bit problematic. But anyway, welcome and I'm uh, very happy to see, uh, to see all of you here. Okay, we'll talk about compactness and incompactness at small cardinals. Uh, in some sense, um, uh, Laura yesterday uh, stole my, uh, my introduction, but uh, in spite of that, I, I think I'll do it and uh, uh, remind you. So, uh, the, the lecture today will be, uh, I don't know whether we'll cover everything, but uh, the plan is to, to talk about compactness and uh, reflection, the, two the dual properties of compactness and reflection, uh, talk about large cardinals and compactness, this is something that for most of you will be, or many of you will be familiar. And uh, uh, the, uh, to what extent we can get compact um, small cardinals to satisfy some property of compactness. So uh, usually what we do, we consider uh, some properties of mathematical structures. It could be a wide variety of, um, of properties. And compactness for a given property is a statement that uh, can uh, allow you to infer from the fact that the property holds at a very small substructure than the property holds at the structure itself. Now, small, there the may be a little bit uh, difference in what, what small means. Um, and uh, when you say the property holds at, uh, um, at every small substructure, maybe uh, um, sometimes it's enough to, to hold it in enough small, uh, small structures. But uh, in this uh, tutorial, small typically will mean uh, having cardinality less than, um, less than something. Okay, now let's look at um, uh, f examples of properties. And all the, all the properties I'm listing were things that were considered independently of, uh, well, some of them are, would be set theoretical. I try to keep it set theoretical in the sense that, that um, I don't want to assume too much background in other fields. But uh, there were properties that were studied on their own merits. I mean, they, the people were considering these properties anyway. So uh, the existence of transversal that was mentioned by, uh, I think, Laura yesterday. Uh, so transversal for a family of non-empty sets is a one-to-one -one choice function on the family, something that picks a member from uh, um, every member of the family. And suppose that every smaller cardinality subfamily of, of F as a transversal, does that mean that F itself is a transversal? Uh, usually, you have to have to make sense of this problem. You have to make some restriction on the family F. Otherwise, it's relatively easy to get counter example. So let's just for the um, for being more uh, concrete, let's think about F as a, a family of countable sets. And there, there are good reasons why this particular case is especially uh, besides of the fact that countable is the most interesting case in a way. But but uh, it's um, there, there are good reasons for um, uh, for making this restriction. Now, something which is somewhat similar is something I call disjointifying. Namely, f of infinite sets, disjointifying f means that you pick um, um, a finite subset of each of the sets so that what's left is a family of mutual disjoint sets. Namely, you, um, uh, so here is the family. Mm, that's challenging. Oh. Here is the family that might have some, some intersection. And this jointifying means that you, you pick a finite, you eliminate some finite set from, uh, from each of the sets, so that now they become a disjoint, a mutually disjoint family, uh, family of sets. Uh, and again, suppose that for every smaller cardinality subfamily, uh, F can be disjointified, can F be uh, disjointified? And again, we probably will talk about uh, only about uh, countable, family of countable sets, though it's interesting in a general case. Now, something that will be will play a major role in the uh, uh, talks of uh, the tutorial after me of uh, uh, Peter Komiat, uh, that um, chromatic numbers, uh, G is a graph such that every subgraph of G is a chromatic number uh, bounded by lambda. Does that mean that um, the, the old graph is chromatic number bounded by lambda? We see, by the way, that this problem is actually very, uh, in some sense, more challenging than other uh, problems. Uh, coloring numbers, it's some, something related to chromatic numbers. It's some kind of uh, uh, structure, property of the graph that uh, implies that it's got chromatic number uh, less or equal lambda, which means that you can well order 
the nodes of the, of the graph such that every node is connected to less than lambda nodes appearing before, before it in the, in the well ordering. Again, that will play a role in, your, um, in the talk uh, uh, after me. So, uh, by the way, I'm not, uh, not hesitant to have a, just a little bit of overlap between the talks. I don't think it's a, such a bad idea. Okay, so, so again, the question is, suppose that every smaller cardinality subgraph of G has coloring number lambda, does G as a coloring number lambda? Some algebraic examples, and again, uh, th these are uh, examples of uh, um, um, uh, from a white, this is just a representative case of a long list of things. You say that a billion group is free if it can be represented as direct sum of copies of the simplest abelian group, which is infinite abelian group, which is um, uh, z, the integers. And um, so uh, if you can write it as direct sum, namely, think about that as vectors of uh, integers. The group is made up of essentially equivalent to vectors of integers, where only finitely many um, coordinates are different than zero. And suppose that every smaller cardinality um, subgroup of H is free. Does that mean that H itself is free? Now there is something, a notion which I called, it's not a standard uh, uh, terminology, but I think that uh, this, this concept is um, uh, dual to the concept of, uh, of freeness, and there are the good reasons why is that I call it free star. Uh, so the abelian group is said to be free star if, it is, if um, uh, you can take, rather than taking a direct sum of copies of Z, you take a direct product, namely you take vectors which you got coordinates, uh, everything could be coordinate. Now here you have to change the definition a little bit in the sense that it's not just that H can be represented. Uh, you have to uh, expand the notion because um, it, it's very useful if the, the concept you're talking, the concept of freeness you're talking about, is closed under taking sub substructures. Now, if a group is a um, um, direct product of, um, of copies of Z, it doesn't mean that every subgroup is of that form. So let's put it, uh, let's put it by force by simply putting into the definition. We say that the group is free star if um, it's, um, um, it's a subgroup of uh, the product of Z. By the way, there is no problem here. Uh, a subgroup, uh, it's a classical theorem that a subgroup of, uh, um, of a free group uh, is, um, uh, is free. So again, the problem is uh, if um, uh, every su um, smaller cardinality subgroup is free, free star, does that mean that the group is free star? Uh, metraceability, uh, take a topological space, such that every subspace of a smaller cardinality is metric, is X itself metric. Uh, again, in order to avoid um, uh, s uh, simple counterexamples, uh, assume that X is first countable. Counterexamples, you, you could have uh, a space where um, every smaller cardinality subspace is really discrete, and, but the whole space is very non-metric. So, so you can easily get counterexamples. So, so the issue is, um, uh, let's assume that X is first countable, which make it a little bit more. Now, collection with Ausdorf, that, that definitely related to, uh, relates to the uh, problem of metraceability. You have a topological space. You've got a discrete closed uh, set, namely a set of points that never converge to anything. Uh, we say that Y can be separated if there is a family of mutually, if you can separate them, uh, get the uh, usual se topological separation, you've got an uh, open set around each of them, such that the open sets are mutually disjoint. And suppose that every smaller cardinality subset of Y can be separated. Can Y be separated? Again, you can get easily counterexamples, but the issue is, can you assume something about the space that will guarantee that, uh, uh, that, it's, um, uh, that from small, from the fact that it's small collection-wise Ausdorf implies that if a set can be a small part, a small discrete um, uh, set can be separated and the whole, um, the whole thing can be, um, can be separated. Okay, uh, so now uh, a dual thing to compactness, and uh, Laura spoke about it, is that uh, uh, reflection principle is something which is dual to, um, to compactness. Uh, suppose that a structure, uh, typically it has the form that, uh, suppose that A has um, a certain property, then um, now you're talking about the, the whole structure having a property, and now you want to reflect it to a small substructure. Then there exists a small substructure uh, having the property. Uh, and a reflection principle are dual to compactness principles. A reflection principle for a given property is equivalent to a compactness for the negation of the property, and vice versa, of course. Uh, so uh, uh, when we we'll talk, we'll talk mostly about in terms of compactness, but um, 
there are some principles for which it is more convenient to talk about the reflection version rather than, rather than the compactness. So it's, it's a matter of either um, what was the traditional way of doing it or what's the, the um, uh, whether it's more convenient to talk about reflection or... Um, now, more ex other examples from set theory. Stationary set reflection, that's a reflection principle. I mean, you can state it as a compactness for, compactness for being non-stationary. But um, so you've got a regular cardinal, you have a stationary subset of kappa. Is there a smaller um, ordinal such that S intersect alpha is stationary a subset of alpha? And again, you have to assume something about kappa, maybe something about a stationary set. But definitely, it's a, from the set uh, theoretical point of view, it's a very interesting problem. Tree property is an example of um, um, compactness principle. You've got a tree with lambda many levels, so that every level has cardinality less than lambda, does uh, t as a branch of, of length lambda. That's essentially a compactness property. Okay, so, uh, so we've got all these, um, uh, all these examples. Um, for the tree property, the answer is always yes, and it's say to have the tree property, like omega, that's an example, that's Koenig's lemma. If, uh, and lambda is called weakly compact, if it's inaccessible and has the tree property. Again, for most of you, uh, that's a familiar, uh, familiar notion of a large cardinal. Okay, so now uh, I, I won't even to think about Chang's conje uh, Chang conjecture or Chang, uh, I would talk about Chang uh, property, uh, uh, which is um, um, a model theoretic problem introduced by Sissi Chang. And uh, um, in, in actually, you can also consider it a kind of uh, reflection principle. And it says you, you, you have a structure, um, uh, a model with signature. Signature is the, the language. Uh, it contains a distinguished unary predicate. And you say that it is of type uh, kappa lambda if the cardinality of the old domain is kappa, but the, um, uh, this unary predicate has got uh, cardinality lambda. And uh, we say that um, uh, kappa lambda arrows kappa tilde lambda tilde if every structure of countable signature of type kappa lambda is a substructure uh, of type um, uh, kappa, um, kappa tilde lambda tilde, namely, if you could, um, you have, you have uh, uh, the structure A looks like uh, here is the all the all structure A, and then now you've got a predicate R A, which is um, um, uh, the cardinality. This cardinality is uh, kappa. This cardinality is lambda, and now you want to, to find a, a substructure where, where, uh, um, where um, uh, the whole thing is uh, is kappa bar, kappa tilde, and this part is uh, lambda tilde. And uh, uh, it's got interesting um, uh, set theoretical. Uh, um, no, you have to be closer, I guess. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so Chang question. It's, it, it, Chang didn't ask. The, it, he asked the question only for particular case we talk about. But let's uh, t look at a generalized uh, Chang question for which lambda, um, uh, and, and we we restrict the case where um, uh, um, where kappa is exactly the successor of lambda. So we have um, um, w if we have a structure of type lambda plus lambda, does uh, it is a substructure of types lambda tilde plus um, uh, lambda. Okay, a related problem. Suppose that the structure uh, is well ordered, where the order type is a regular cardinal. And the question, can we find the proper substructure where the order type is also a regular cardinal? Could we reflect the fact uh, to something which the, the order type is a uh, regular cardinal? Oh, so now it's just a, a few um, standard and uh, uh, immediate definitions. So given a property of mathematical structure, we say that the cardinal kappa is a reflection cardinal for this property. Uh, that's, by the way, close to the, sometimes you might say, uh, um, uh, weakly compact cardinal for the, or, or weakly refle reflection cardinal, but if every structure of cardinality kappa is a substructure of cardinality less than kappa having the given property, if you can reflect, if, if you are at kappa, you can reflect the, the, the property to something of cardinality less than kappa. Uh, kappa is a strong reflection property if the same holds for every structure, no, no restriction, not, uh, not restricting any more um, uh, the cardinality, uh, namely that every, every structure uh, having, having the property as a substructure of cardinality less than kappa having the given property. Whether you can reflect uh, everything that goes uh, above kappa, you can reflect it down to, uh, to something of cardinality less than kappa. 
Okay, so that's a strong reflection property. Dually, of course, you have the definition for compactness cardinals. Uh, a cardinal is weakly compact. Sometimes we, we'll drop the weakly. Uh, for a given property, if a structure of cardinality kappa is the given property, given that every substructure uh, less than kappa is the property. Namely, you, you, you from small, from the fact that the property also small um, cardinals, you could uh, um, hold it for, for uh, at kappa, where kappa is, uh, uh, where the structure has got cardinality kappa. Now, kappa is strongly compact cardinal for the property. If every structure, no restriction on the cardinality, is the property, um, uh, given that every substructure of cardinality less than kappa um, has the property. So now it's um, something that applies to a structure of any, any cardinality. The reason I call it strongly compact is that um, the notion, and we'll, we'll get to the uh, notion, you know, the large cardinal concept of strongly compact, um, is the fact that uh, actually for most of the properties, and um, actually for every single properties that, uh, well, chunk conjecture is a little bit different, but every single property we listed here, um, the, the usual notion of strong compactness implies strong compactness for that, for that property. So now we talk strong compactness for a particular property. Now duality of reflection, compactness kappa is a reflection cardinal for a certain property, if and only if it's a compactness cardinal for the negation of a property. Now, um, uh, now th this is a fact similar to what I said now, that weakly compact, the standard notion of weakly compact, remember tree property and uh, um, inaccessible, it's automatically compact for um, any of the properties uh, that we listed, listed above. Okay, so now uh, we are going to talk about large, large cardinals. And again, for most of you, it's familiar, but I uh, uh, decided to uh, still to talk about. So a typical um, uh, large cardinal definition is that kappa is something, if there is a transitive class M, an elementary embedding um, from, uh, from the universe into M, that kappa is the critical point, the first point moved by kappa, such that M is closed under. And the more closure, the more similarity of M to the, to the universe V, the, 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 the stronger the cardinal. So you want, to, you want it to be, um, so a typical uh, measurability is uh, equivalent essentially to um, having elementary embedding with kappa, the critical point. You don't have to make any assumption about the closure of the, of the transitive class. Having an elementary embedding like that, it automatically implies, uh, it's, it, it, it's the usual notion of measurability. Strongness, kappa is lambda strong if there is uh, uh, j from uh, v into m, kappa the critical point, and v kappa plus lambda. Here there is a little bit of um, difference of terminology. Sometimes uh, here you talk about uh, v lambda rather than v kappa plus lambda, but let's say, uh, I prefer this um, uh, notation. I will not, spoke, uh, will not speak about strong cardinals very much. And kappa is strong if it is lambda strong for all lambda. Then for all lambda, you got, you got an embedding. Uh, the embedding depends on lambda because otherwise, you, you can't have one embedding which works for, uh, for everything because of Kunin's result that there is no, that uh, Yu Woodin was uh, talking about, there is no uh, embedding from, uh, from uh, the universe to itself. And supercompactness, which already appeared, Lambda is supercompact if there is a j from v into m with kappa critical point, and such that uh, m is closed not just about um, um, v lambda or v lambda plus kappa, but, but all lambda sequences from m are in m. Without loss of generality, we can assume that, um, that kappa jumps above lambda, and kappa is supercompact if it's lambda supercompact for all lambda. Uh, this is, uh, you can put it part of the definition, but uh, you don't have to, because you can show that if uh, kappa is, um, uh, if there is an embedding like that with, uh, uh, if, if j of kappa uh, happened to be less than lambda, you can find another embedding that will move kappa above lambda. So supercompactness means that, that um, uh, then for every, oh, okay, I'll, for every kappa, here is, um, uh, here is v, here is kappa, you can find uh, an embedding into m, m lambda. So the kappa jumps somewhere here. This is j kappa. Here is lambda. J kappa jumps above lambda. But m is close enough. m lambda is closed under uh, sequences. Namely, if you take a sequence of members of m lambda um, in V, which... Um, uh, um, sorry? Oh. Uh, do you want me to repeat here? 
it's one of okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, uh Sorry? You were accidentally were holding right on the... Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I was... Uh, sorry about that. Okay. So, um, um, in some sense, um, uh, super compact is the ultimate um, strongly compact. Uh, in the sense that uh, it's only compact for many, many uh, interesting properties. And uh, uh, so here's the theorem, a cardinal supercompact, if it's strongly compact cardinal, for every property which you can express in second order logic, second order logic where you quantify over uh, subsets of the structure, um, uh, functions that you can define on the structure, and so on. Uh, but um, if, if you want uh, to have a real equivalence to the um, kappa being um, uh, supercompact, you want uh, um, a second order logic uh, you, uh, you, you want to allow conjunction or disjunction of the, of the statements uh, of, of size less than kappa, if you want to have uh, equivalence. If you just want um, implication, there is a supercompact cardinal if and only if there is a strongly compact cardinal for every second order property. And the first supercompact is the first cardinal which is strongly compact for any second order property. So, so um, uh, the existence of supercompactness is simply a kind of compactness principle or reflection principle for every second order property. Um, in fact, you could um, uh, uh, get something weaker than second order property, to an equivalence which is not full second order, the uh, equivalence will be still true. You can have um, um, uh, uh, compactness for properties more than uh, second order, you can have it for, uh, for third order, uh, fourth order, and so on. But, uh, okay, uh, a properties we consider can be expressed in a profit infinitary version of second order logic, all the properties we, we talk about. So, uh, uh, so all the properties like that, supercompactness is good enough for, um, uh, for having a reflection. Okay, so um, uh, let me just give a, a very brief, for, for most of you it will be well known, but the reason I want to, to, um, to repeat the proof, because it will be a prototype of other things we uh, hopefully will be doing. So kappa is supercompact, and we have a structure of uh, cardinality less than kappa. A is a structure of signature, the, the language of the cardinality less than kappa. And every substructure of cardinality less than kappa is a certain property that you can express by second order sentence uh, psi. Namely, every uh, smaller cardinality substructure is satisfying psi, and you want to, to, to infer that uh, the structure itself satisfies psi. So let lambda be the cardinality of A. By the supercompactness of lambda, uh, we find an elementary embedding uh, of V into M. Uh, such that the critical point is kappa, j of kappa jumps above lambda, and m, um, m is closed under lambda sequences. Now consider the image of A under, un, um, under um, uh, j. The image is in m, because this is something of size, uh, of size lambda, and it's a substructure, by elementarity, it's a substructure of the image of A, of j of A. You've got two, two types of images. This is simply the, uh, the point-wise um, j applied to, to A, and this is uh, all of J of A. Now, by the closure of, of, of M, um, J of A, a is, uh, still has got cardinality lambda, which is less than J kappa. And, um, and therefore, since in, in the original, in V, we thought that every smaller cardinality substructure satisfies the, the formula psi, M thinks that, um, um, that uh, J double look of, um, uh, of of A is a uh, small substructure of J of A, and therefore it, it believes it has the property. So uh, M believes that it has the property. But now comes the, the thing. By the closure of M, it's, it's closed under enough sub subsets in size of second order statements. Therefore, uh, if M believes that, that's, that uh, uh, J double hook uh, of A satisfied psi, then really in V, J double hook of, uh, of A satisfied psi. By J double look of A is, is isomorphic to A, hence um, um, A itself satisfied Psi, and this is exactly uh, what we wanted to show. Okay, so that's a uh, sketch. Now, uh, uh, reflection, when we talk about reflection properties, sorry? Well, one direction, no, no, I, 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 I'm not promising to, to do uh, full proofs. Actually, I warned in the abstract, you see that I, I got a disclaimer that uh, <laughs> not this. 
uh, I hope that even even the proofs, even uh, the sketches of the, the, the proofs I intend to do, I will be able to do. That's uh, okay. So um, so supercompactness gives us uh, you know a lot of uh, uh, a lot of reflection, reflection for everything, reflection or compactness for uh, uh, for everything. So now uh, um, stationary reflection is some in some sense is the, the worst failure of reflection you could have. Well, a kind of. Uh, in the sense that, um, um, especially uh, failure of stationary reflection for, s for a stationary set of points of cofinality omega. Now suppose that kappa is a regular cardinal and uh, you've got a stationary set of kappa such that for every uh, alpha in S the cofinality is uh, omega. And suppose that S does not reflect. Namely, S intersect alpha is not stationary in alpha for every alpha less than kappa. Then for most of the properties, not, not, uh, not everything, not everything I know, and, uh, uh, but for most of the properties I listed, most of the properties we consider, then compactness, the compactness properties we are talking about fails for, uh, for kappa. So you can generate from a non-reflecting stationary set, you can uh, um, uh, generate uh, a lot of counterexamples to, um, to compactness. And, uh, um, and definitely, uh, I mean, Aleph 1 is a kind of, uh, in a trivial sense, it has a, um, a stationary set of points of covenant omega that doesn't reflect, namely alpha, alpha 1 itself. So alpha 1 is not compact for anything, nothing interesting. Uh, alpha 1 cannot be uh, compact. In some sense, you, th you can think that it's, uh, I mentioned the one of the properties of compactness, uh, the tree property. So uh, having an Arnstein tree, having the tree property failing for alpha 1, that means alpha 1 is, is bad. The issue is what are the other bad, bad cardinals and are there really bad cardinals, and we'll see uh, in a minute, I hope, that uh, for certain properties, uh, Aleph 2 can be compact. So Aleph 2 is more, is uh, uh, a chance of being, uh, uh, being compact. It doesn't have to because of the failure of, uh, could fail reflection. So now let, let, let's um, uh, see an example of, the, of, um, of this fact that, um, uh, that non-reflecting stationary sets give you a counterexample to reflection. And out of the many, uh, the large um, zoo of, of uh, of possibilities, I picked the um, uh, possibility of uh, metrizability. Uh, you can find, suppose that there exists a non-reflecting stationary set of points of finality omega, then there, uh, there you can find the first countable space of cardinality kappa, so that every subspace of smaller cardinality is metric, but the whole space is not, uh, is not metric. Namely, you could, you could block it. Okay, so, and let's see. So for each limit alpha of um, in S, in the, in the um, Oh, okay, now it becomes a bit more challenging to. Uh, you asked me to use stronger color. What happens to all the colors? What, what did I do with it? Uh, you put it. Okay, without even noticing, I, I moved all of them here. Okay, so so the, the space is so here is here is kappa. Here you got the typical alpha in S. So you pick um, uh, an omega sequence. You got cofinality omega. You pick an omega sequence. Converging to it, this is the beta, um, how do you know them, beta alpha n. And uh, just to avoid, um, uh, you know, just conflict of, uh, you want that the, the points are not, not in S, you can make them successors, so that guarantee that they are not, um, uh, not in S. And we define a topology, the topology you define, that on, on point which is not in S, it's simply the discrete topology. Each of the, um, it's um, um, open able by itself. Now, for, for alpha in S, uh, open neighborhood of it, you require that it contains a tail of the, um, of the beta n converging to alpha. That's a very simple, um, very simple topology. It's definitely uh, uh, first, first countable. Now, for every alpha less than kappa, the space, um, the space alpha tau is metric. Um, es essentially, um, um, the, um, um, what you have to show is that whenever you cut cut it off at a certain alpha, then uh, the alpha intersect, alpha intersect S. Uh, S is, uh, there is a typo here, there should be uh, an S here. It can be separated. Namely, you could find a point in S and find a um, um, uh, disjoint open uh, neighborhoods around them. What, what is an open neighborhood? Open neighborhood <coughs> is simply a tail of the, of the sequence. And for that, you use the fact that S does not, um, uh, does not reflect. Uh, the way you prove it, um, I don't want to get um, to details, and again, if uh, there will be a discussion session today, uh, so maybe uh, Chris, uh, 
so maybe if you know if there is interest if people don't don't see it all right away that you can you can separate in that case using the fact that s um, uh, does not reflect um, and uh, the way you do it you do it by induction you look at intervals from beta into alpha and you show that you can find um, a separation uh, that um, uh, okay I'll, I'll leave it for for, for discussion then the proof of by induction alpha now the space is not is not metric that's also uh, relatively easy to uh, to do so here is an example of um, um, of um, um, uh, Failure of reflection following from the existence of non-reflecting stationary set. So this is, um, um, and, and uh, you can find many, many, uh, um, many of the properties. So I repeat it: if you have a non-reflecting stationary set, then for most of the properties there is no. St the, so if if you find some some uh, uh, kappa, uh, you have a stationary, a non-reflecting stationary set. You cannot have a not, not just kappa itself is not compact. You can you cannot you cannot have any strongly compact cardinal for the property b below kappa. Now, uh, what, what does that imply? By theorem of Jensen, in the constructible universe, every regular cardinal kappa, most regular cardinals do have a non-reflecting stationary set. Actually, for, uh, uh, in, in order to stationary set reflect, the cardinal itself must be already a relatively, uh, what I might call small large cardinal, namely, uh, it, it must be uh, weakly compact. So the corollary from that is that, that, um, um, that for the properties we listed, a regular cardinal is weak in L, a regular cardinal is weakly compact if and only if it's, it's fully weakly, if and only fully weakly compact. So comp compactness for the properties is really equivalent to being fully weakly compact. And there is no, um, uh, and there is no strong compact cardinal for the property. L doesn't, doesn't believe in strong compactness. It simply doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. Uh, so uh, um, now it, it means that uh, compactness requires. When I say requires large cardinal, I mean requires consistency of large cardinals. If kappa is strong compact with respect to any of the above properties, then that means that for every regular lambda greater or equal than kappa, every stationary set you got a, ref a reflection uh, of uh, stationary set of points of an omega everywhere. Uh, now again, uh, I don't have time to get into it, but that implies the consistency of some very, very large cardinal. Actually, how large, it's not, um, not clear. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's something in the order of magnitude of strong compactness. If you want to have everywhere non-reflecting stationary set, because it means, again, for the, um, for the initiated, uh, it uh, requires failure of square everywhere, and, uh, uh, and so on. So, so that, that's a very uh, large assumption. Now suppose that kappa is super compact. Uh, you can have um, uh, you can arrange the following situation. You can arrange the situation that um, that uh, unboundedly many uh, cardinals below kappa that keeps kappa super compact, but uh, you got unboundedly many uh, cardinals below kappa, which uh, there is a non-reflecting subs. Um, uh, you got unboundedly many lambdas below kappa such that there exists S non-reflecting, uh, points of covenalty omega, and still keeps the supercompactness of kappa. You, you simply have to pick these cardinals um, sparse enough so that you keep the supercompactness of kappa. By the way, it makes kappa the first uh, uh, supercompact. What does that imply? That implies that um, in this model, we do have compact cardinal for, uh, or strongly compact cardinal for the properties we listed, but the first strongly compact cardinal for the, for the property is the first supercompact. You can't, you can't have anything which is smaller than, than, than kappa. Because you have, uh, if you, you take a smaller cardinal, above it, you have something which is a non-reflecting stationary set. So kappa is the first strongly compact cardinal for, for the property. So it is consistent that, that uh, you do have compact cardinal for the property. For each of the properties, there is a compact cardinal for the property, but the first strongly compact cardinal of the property is the first supercompact. It, it, they all converge to the same thing, the first strongly compact. So the question is really becomes a question of consistency. Uh, so the question of, uh, which is the title of this tutorial, um, compactness properties of small, um, small cardinals, the issue becomes um, whether it's consistent to have um, uh, small compact or strongly compact cardinal. That's for the property. Yeah? Uh, no, I'm 
not ex kind of yeah well the, the technique for preserving let, let me say the following thing not not the theorem I didn't state it in the thesis but the technique by which you use to to prove it it really was introduced because in, in the thesis I have um, a technique for preserving for doing forcing below the super uh, the super compact preserving the super compactness so the the, the technique is uh, uh, is used for 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 showing that okay so uh, I thought that I'm still a, uh, a young satirist. Uh, okay, actually, it's rather shocking. I, mean, I get to the point where, in many meetings, I'm literally the oldest participant. So. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, now uh, we do have compact. Uh, th there is something which uh, which is very re remarkable result. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to to give the proof. It require at least one hour, if not, if not more than that, uh, of Shellach, that uh, si the singular, uh, singular compactness, namely for many of the properties, not for, for all of them, but many of the properties, uh, that uh, if the property is satisfied, uh, that a singular cardinal is automatically compact. Namely, if you could um, get a property at a very small cardinality um, um, uh, substructure of the uh, structure of, of singular uh, cardinality, then automatically the structure uh, would have it. So examples of um, uh, where the um, Shellach singular cardinal uh, compactness implies is the existence of transversal disjointifying coloring number. By the way, not uh, not necessarily chromatic number. Uh, freeness of abelian groups. The property of being collectionized Ausdorf. For, for a certain collection of spaces, uh, spaces which are locally of cardinality less than lambda, namely that every point has got a uh, point of cardinality less than lambda, and, uh, and many, many other uh, uh, properties. E essentially, the Shellach thing talks about notions which are, uh, satisfy kind of abstract, the property should satisfy some uh, abstract um, um, concept of freeness, uh, we'll not get into it. So the question is, can a small regular cardinal be compact cardinal for interesting properties? This is the question we shall, we shall try and, uh, um, and deal with. So omega 1 is out. The question is, could we... Um, okay, so let's, let, let's see that uh, we can get um, uh, compactness for um, interesting properties for um, omega 2. So assume the existence of supercompact cardinal. Then it is consistent that omega 2 is strongly compact cardinal with respect to the property of these jointifying families of countable set. You remember this jointifying property. So let's see that, uh, um, uh, um, how do you get the, um, um, the consistency of this, um, um, of, of um, a strong compactness for, uh, so building up the model is very, is the simplest you can think about. Uh, okay, uh, but here is something that, maybe I've done it in the wrong order. In a minute I'll describe the model. But, uh, Here's a family of countable sets. And now suppose you got, um, uh, here is a notation, a standard notation that, uh, at least for these talks, you, you should be, uh, get used to it. P omega 1 of F, this is the collection of all uh, countable subsets of, of F, or in general, um, uh, did I take it or? Uh, So, uh, uh, in general, P kappa or lambda is the set of all subsets of lambda of cardinality less than kappa. Now, they are partially ordered by, by, by inclusion. So, P omega 1 of F is the set of countable subsets. Now, we say that a set for the family, we've got a family uh, of countable sets. We say that the set is bad countable set is bad, if you can find something which is outside, here is the family, the family F, which is made up of um, which made up of this countable, made up of this countable, uh, countable sets. And now, uh, you say that um, uh, a certain collection of countable, countable subfamily of F is bad, if you, you can find something outside, an outsider, that intersects the union of, the, of that family in an infinite set. So an outsider that dares to pick something which 
belongs belongs only to the um, to the members of the inner club of X. Okay, so so now um, um, a simple lemma that says that F um, uh, suppose that the cardinality of F is lambda, but lambda is regular, and suppose that for every smaller cardinality subset can be disjointified, then F can be then uh, suppose you already managed to disjointify, you know that you can disjointify every smaller cardinality subset. Then F can be disjointified if and only if the um, the set of countable um, subsets that X is bad is is not stationary in P omega one of, of F. What is stationary subset of, of P kappa of lambda? Uh, a stationary subset of P kappa of lambda is simply. Um, did I make the definition here? Or, um, Okay, no, I did not. Okay, so um, a, a, a subset of P kappa lambda is stationary. This is um, a generalization of the notion of stationary for, uh, for cardinals, for ordinals. It seems it's for every, if for every algebra or structure, doesn't mean, algebra, with the signature, let's say, A, you can find a subalgebra that exists to B a subalgebra that belongs belongs to S, namely that you could you, you could define some some operations on lambda, and you can find something which is closed under these operations that belongs to the set. That means that the set is um, um, is stationary, and they 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 behave uh, a lot like stationary subset of um, uh, of a cardinal. So having um, um, uh, you can disjointify if and only if um, um, the um, uh, the set of bad, bad thing is not is not um, uh, is not stationary. Uh, let me very briefly tell you why is that. Because if uh, oh, that's a problem. The one that is the stronger color also more difficult to erase. Uh, well, so, so suppose that. Um, um, I'll, I'll just uh, indicate one, one direction. Suppose that um, uh, F can be disjointified. Suppose that F can be uh, disjointified. Then, uh, namely, you can find, um, you remember, disjointified means finding a finite subset such that when you eliminate, they become disjoint. So suppose that for every X in F, for every X is bad, bad thing, suppose that for every A in X, find um, uh, Z sub A, subset of A, finite, such that uh, uh, the collection Z minus AZ, uh, AZ, I'm sorry, minus Z uh, for A in, in F are disjoint. So now consider a very simple algebra. The simple algebra is that you uh, first, a anything which is closed under algebra, uh, find an algebra which, which is uh, made up of, of lambda, namely on the, um, which is made up of F, including the union of F. Now, what is the operation? The operation, one operation guarantees that anything which is closed, that if B is a subalgebra, then um, alpha belonging, um, or uh, if um, A belongs to, to B, to a subalgebra, then that means that A is a subset of B. Now, remember, we are talking about countable, we're talking about countable sets. And now, also, we have this um, uh, collection of, of finite, finite sets. So now also have an operation which picks for, for a member of the union of F, so for um, uh, T, which is to the union of F, define a function that tells you, um, uh, define, um, uh, let's say, G of T to be the unique A in F such that uh, T belongs to um, A minus, uh, minus Z of A. Of course, uh, it's unique because, because the sets are now, now disjoint. Now, suppose you take something which is closed under the, the operation of the, um, um, which is closed under the operation of the uh, algebra. You take uh, x in p, uh, take x in p omega 1 of f, so that x is closed under these operations. If x is bad, what happens? There exists something, some A outside of X, such that A intersect X is infinite. Right? But then, um, 
Now pick any point, pick a t, which belongs to, t pick a t which belongs to a intersect x minus, um, minus uh, z of a. Remember, uh, z of a is finite, so, so there, there's something, something left here. But, so the unique t which, the unique a which t belongs to should be in x, but you were taking a, uh, a outside of x. That's a contradiction. That means that anything closed under the, um, the operations that I defined here is not, um, is not bad. And uh, this is one direction. That namely, if it can be jointified, then the uh, collection of bad, bad things is, um, um, uh, is not stationary. Now, for the other direction, uh, I need the fact that every smaller cardinal, uh, I mean, I didn't use the fact that every smaller cardinality subset can be disjointified, but uh, that for the, for the other direction, which I'll, I'll omit again, if there would be interest, maybe you could, you could do it. Okay, so let kappa be super compact. Now I want to get the model. So you obtain the model by forcing with uh, uh, the Levy collapse of all cardinals in the interval omega one uh, kappa to uh, the open interval to omega one. Collapse all the cardinals, um, uh, Below, uh, but the usual, uh, usual, um, uh, usual Levy collapse. And uh, let um, uh, V1 be the resulting, the resulting model. Now the term we will prove, if we show that in V1, if F is a family of countable sets at every subfamily of cardinality less or equal omega 1. Remember, we want to show that omega 2 is, is um, um, strong compact for the property. Can be disjointified and F can be disjointified. Now we prove it by induction on the cardinality of, um, of f, of the set. Now the case lambda uh, greater or equal, less or equal omega 1, this is exactly the, the induction assumption. Uh, I'm sorry, this is exactly the, um, uh, the basic assumption. Every uh, subfamily of cardinality omega 1 can be jointified. The case lambda singular follows from Schellach singular compactness. So we are left with the case lambda regular. So we are in a case where we got a regular cardinal Every um, smaller uh, uh, sub, the cardinality of f is lambda. Every smaller cardinality subfamily uh, can be jointified. Um, and so we, we um, so suppose it fails. We cannot disjointify the whole family f. Now that means that the set of, of x's in the, in the countable, countable subset of f that is bad is, um, is stationary. The bad um, stationary means non non-negligible, non, not, not null. So that means you've got uh, many bad, bad sets. Now the, the fact that kappa was super compact in V is used to show, again maybe, I don't know whatever, <laughs> I want to load on you everything that, but uh, that in V1, uh, we want to show that in V1 there exists some, some subfamily of cardinality less or equal um, uh, omega 1 which such that uh, you, you can reflect the fact that um, to, to a subfamily of size alpha one, where uh, um, uh, that that also is bad in the sense that the set of bad countable sets is um, uh, is uh, stationary. Um, there is something missing here. It should be say that this set is stationary. Now, b by by the by the lemma applied to to f prime, um, f prime cannot be disjointified. And that's a contradiction. We, we are getting a subfamily of cardinality less than less than equal to omega one. Now, a sketch of the proof of the claim: um, you have um, a generic object for g omega one kappa. Now, uh, actually, I'll, I'll, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. It's too, too sketchy. But here, here is exactly uh, this is ex um, um, this proof is in some sense. Uh, remember that I gave you the proof, the easy and well-known proof of the. Uh, that the, the reflection for um, um, uh, for supercompact cardinal, this is modeled after the same proof. That, that was the reason that, that I gave um, um, I gave the uh, uh, I gave the proof, namely that uh, in some sense, uh, okay, maybe I'll say something about it. Uh, in some sense, what you say. Uh, here is kappa the supercompact. Here is omega one. We collapse everything here to, to omega one. That's a model. Now remember, in the ground model, kappa was was supercompact. But now, what happens is that uh, so we got v one where uh, where kappa was already collapsed. 
Now, uh, the crucial thing is that you can find originally before before kappa was before we collapsed kappa, there was an embedding. There was a j from v into some m, such that uh, j of kappa is above lambda and m to the lambda included in m. Now the point is that now uh, and kappa moves moves up. Now a standard technique is extending generic extension of the of the embedding. Namely, we can um, uh, find. Um, the original forcing was collapse omega 1, everything less than kappa. From the point of view of M, you want to consider the, the image of that uh, forcing notion, collapse uh, less than J kappa, which can be written as collapse omega 1 less than kappa, followed by something, something else, by some, by some Q. And now, the point is if you force with the Q, you can extend the embedding to, uh, you can extend the embedding to, um, uh, uh, you can find a, a bigger model in which the, there is an extension of the bending in V1 um, to M. And now you argue basically very, very similar to the, um, the, to the proof, but there is some preservation theorem, but uh, I will not. Um, uh. Okay. So omega, uh, uh, omega 2 can be strongly compact even for many other properties. Uh, uh, when, when you do that, uh, for instance, it can be strongly compact for the property of collection-wise Ausdorf in topological spaces, which, which is locally countable. Um, the, the, the thing about collection-wise Ausdorf has got interesting behavior, which I'll not have time to uh, elaborate on. But if you talk about spaces which are locally countable, which every, every point has got a countable neighborhood, uh, it's, um, um, you get strong compactness for that, for that property. It's strongly compact for property of the graph having coloring number, uh, coloring number LF0, coloring number, not chromatic number. Chromatic number, we, uh, uh, we don't know. Uh, so uh, we did get uh, omega-2 to have many, uh, many interesting uh, compactness or re reflection property. So the question is, for the other properties we listed, how, how, how small the first cardinal, um, the strongly compact cardinal can be, and actually how small or the first, or how small c should be the, uh, a compact cardinal for that uh, uh, um, for that property, uh, and we'll see that um, while uh, omega two is a natural answer for uh, for many of the properties we listed, there are some that the behavior of these cardinals is much more uh, m more complicated. And uh, um, I think this is as far as I wanted to go today. Thank you. Sure, sure. So, is there something like a hierarchy of properties, probably depending on something like complexity of formulas which express them, which would say that if, if, this, if kappa is compact for this property, then it's compact for that property? There is, um, I wouldn't say hierarchy, that there, were, there is some implications or equivalences between the, uh, the properties. I'm, I'm discovering something that will appear, well, I'm not talking about the proof anyway. Uh, for instance, the property of, um, um, uh, of the freeness for groups is equivalent to the transversal for uh, countable sets. Uh, and there, there, there are several equivalences li like that. Uh, but hierarchy, you know, something Im Im implying something else, th there's not clear hierarchy. Uh, now, as far as complexity of formulas, there is something which will, uh, um, uh, we, you know, w one case of, of a kind of hierarchy where uh, super compact, Michelin has actually, I'm planning it for the last, um, uh, last talk on, on Thursday, that uh, super compact, uh, we're talking super compact is um, uh, reflection or compactness uh, cardinal for uh, or every second order property. You actually can analyze and see exactly what the second order formula, I mean, what is the simplest second order formula for which uh, super compact will give you uh, implication. And if you drop, if you simplify that second order formula a little bit more, then you get a weaker, weaker notion of cardinal. Still a relatively large cardinal, but you, you get a weaker. So that's an example where some relation between the size of a cardinal and complexity of the, of the formula. And other questions? So related to this, um, I understood correctly, super compact is characterized as compactness particle for second order logic yeah. with kappa many convections. Less than kappa, yeah. Uh, less than kappa. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. I, I say that that actually appeared because uh, what happens is that if you talk about the finitely many, note one thing that if it's uh, if the cardinal is strongly compact for in your, in your case, if if the property you're talking about doesn't doesn't contain kappa as a parameter, then uh, if a cardinal is strongly compact for that property, every bigger cardinal trivially is a strongly compact cardinal for that property. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, if at all you're talking about the first the first strongly compact. And there was a theorem saying that if you allow just, um, in the theorem, if you just allow, um, uh, you know, f uh, uh, finitary uh, second order, then what you get is the, uh, the first st strongly compact cardinal for the reflection, all these properties, is, um, is the first supercompact. What, what, what happens if you allow, say, you know, if you, if you allow a large block modifier? So it doesn't matter. I, I, I say the second order, I mean, any 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 collection of quantifiers. No, it's a uh, number of quantifiers. It, uh, it's very robust. Th this result. It could be you know, um, once you're super compact, you could um, you can have thir third order logic. It will, it will give you the same thing. Uh, more than that, uh, actually, if you want a any property that can be expressed as uh, sigma two properties in the hierarchy in the Levy hierarchy set theory. The supercompact give, give you the that reflection. So is there? A yeah. Uh, no, of course. I mean, there is all study of, of freeness. But by the way, uh, it's 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 very similar whether you talk about um, free, uh, whether you talk about um, abelian groups or non-group. I mean, the notion of freeness is of course different, but it's, it's very similar. Uh, it's actually it's something that started a long time ago. If I say these are problems that people were really looking at, were really interested in. So, uh, for instance, well, I want to disc not discover everything that will come now. But for instance, uh, people have shown that um, for the Aleph ends. There exists a, a group which is every smaller cardinality subgroup. The aleph ends are not compact for this property. Um, aleph omega is, by the way, that was done spe uh, specifically for the group, I think, by Hill before, before Scheller. Scheller generalized it to, a, to a, a massive generalization, but it was done by other people, the singular. And uh, aleph omega plus one was, uh, you know, the next cardinal was open for quite, quite some time. Uh, the answer will come will come tomorrow, but uh, so I'll keep you, I'll keep you in suspense. But 